Hi, my name is Carrie O'Neill. I'm the Coral Nursery Manager here at the Florida Aquarium Center for Conservation. The Center for Conservation is located at the Florida Conservation and Technology Center on the property of the Tampa Electric Company. We're also partnering with the University of Florida and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And this site is dedicated entirely towards the conservation, restoration, and education of native Florida species. So here at the Center for Conservation, our coral program is focused on growing Atlantic stony coral species for conservation and restoration. So we have several programs that we're currently working on. One of them is our pillar coral rescue project. So the pillar coral is an extremely threatened species of coral found in the state of Florida on the Florida reef tract. And it's been dying very rapidly of a disease called white plague. Uh, white plague has spread in the past couple years along the Florida reef tract and is killing many species of coral, but the pillar coral has been lost up to 95% in some areas. So what we've done, along with a lot of our partners in the state, is step in and work on the pillar coral rescue project. And this involves taking pieces of all of the known pillar corals that are currently found in Florida and bring them into nursery facilities. And in these nurseries, we've been able to not only treat the disease, um, we've been able to develop a treatment that may be able to be used in the wild one day to help the disease, to stop the disease from progressing in the wild. So we currently have 84 pillar corals here at the Center for Conservation um, and we know the genotype or the genetic makeup of each one of these individuals, what original reef that it came from, and for some of them we even know if it's a male or a female. So eventually we will be putting these pillar corals into a breeding program um, and hoping to reproduce them and make more pillar corals so that we can hopefully restore the, the population in the state of Florida once this disease band has passed. Another program that we're working on that's along those same lines is our coral reproduction and spawning project. So the Florida Aquarium has been going down to the Florida Keys during August for many years for the full moon for the coral spawning that occurs in the Florida Keys just once a year around the August full moon. So what the Florida Aquarium usually does is get a team together, uh, go down to the Florida Keys and wait for the coral spawning, which happens at about 1045 at night, three to five days after the full moon. And we've been doing this primarily with staghorn coral and working with the Coral Restoration Foundation in their Staghorn Coral Nursery. So we go out to the Coral Restoration Foundation Nursery and we get all the corals that are gravid or that means they have eggs and they put them all in one area and we wait for spawning night and we go out with nets and we actually collect all the bundles of eggs and sperm or the gamete bundles. We bring them back into the lab where we can mix them together and fertilize the eggs and then we can actually create new corals and settle them in the laboratory. We bring them back here to the Center for Conservation where we can grow them out. And you'll see some of those corals currently growing in, in the Center for Conservation Coral Nursery. And those corals that we have now were actually born in August 2017. So they're just a little over six months old right now. And we're, we have three different species. So a lot of times when there's multiple researchers working in the Keys because these corals are so spread out in different areas. We usually work on staghorn coral and there's other researchers that work on elkhorn coral or mountainous star coral and then we we actually swap larvae so some will collect from one species and some will collect from the other and then we do our research and then when we have leftover larvae we trade with other researchers so we actually have three different species of coral from the August 20. 17 coral spawning and we have about 600 juvenile corals right now from that one spawning event. And we're hoping to take this spawning work one step further. So we've partnered with the Horniman Museum in London and Jamie Craggs, and some of you may have heard about Jamie's work with Project Coral. So what he has done at the Horniman Museum 
is actually use readily available aquarium, reef aquarium technology to replicate the natural annual cycles of seasonal changes and lighting changes and temperature changes that occur in the ocean and induce corals to spawn in aquariums. And he's been able to do that with pretty much with off the shelf technology. Um, so I went over and visited Jamie in December of 2017 and the Florida Aquarium is now partnering with the Horniman Museum to replicate those systems that Jamie has developed here at the Center for Conservation. And what we're going to do is use these systems to spawn corals from the Atlantic and corals that are currently on the U.S. endangered species list. And we will be able to, by following all the regulations that we have to follow in the state of Florida, um, we will be able to use these corals that are spawned in the Project Coral Systems to use those corals to put back in the ocean for restoration. So we'll have four systems at first, and we'll shift this seasonal cycle by several months in each system so that staghorn coral can actually spawn four times a year. So you can have system one spawning in January, system two spawning in March, system three maybe in June, and system four maybe in, in August or September. Um, and by doing that, you can have, you can literally learn about the species four times faster than you can by only having one spawn a year in the wild. And it, it'll be right here at the Center for Conservation, so it's actually a lot easier for us to, to not have to send a team of divers down and wait for coral spawning at 10.45 at night underwater. Um, with Jamie's systems and the Project Coral Systems, we can come in in the morning and drink our coffee and then check our watch and, and just sit and wait for the corals to spawn. So it's actually a, a much more efficient way to do it, and we will be able to raise a lot more corals in a lot more efficient manner. Uh, and we're getting those systems working and constructing them right now. So we're hoping to have them up and running within the next couple months and we'll be looking at which corals to bring in to stock those systems from other nurseries and hopefully be seen spawning in those systems in a little over a year. So it's a really exciting way to tie in all of our previous work with coral spawning with aquarium technology and how we can use the science of coral spawning as well as really the science of keeping aquariums and bring those two together to help conserve and restore our reefs. And then... Uh... So when everything is wide open, the par in the greenhouse will be six or 700. And that's about a foot underwater. It'll be six or 700. Um, but when I pull that initial level of shade over, that drops to about 300. So 300 be okay for a lot of species of corals, but some of the acroperids, like the staghorn coral, it really likes, likes a good amount of light. So the 300, 350 level is not quite good enough to get really good extension rates on the staghorn coral. So what I end up doing actually is when it's warm outside and I have to have that extra shade cloth over the greenhouse, I've actually added LED lighting on top of the adult staghorn corals because they really do best under about 650 to 750 par. It is when you'll really start to see good extension rates on those and anything less than that, they'll still grow but it's not as fast. Uh, now with the baby corals, it's a bit different. So when they first settle, they have nozos and deli. They haven't taken up that symbiotic algae yet. They have to get that from the environment. So there's really no need for them to have bright lighting and it can actually be harmful because it encourages algae growth, which overgrows the baby coral. So in the beginning, we keep the baby corals very heavily shaded. Now, of course, they, they need to get their nutrition. They're not getting nutrition from the algae, so we need to feed them pretty heavily. So we really use a variety of foods that are found on the, on the market, available to reef hobbyists. At Oyster Feast and Golden Pearls and our larger corals eat Rod's food. We use a variety of products that are all readily available. 
um, but the, the baby corals really need to be fed regularly because they don't have that strong relationship with their algae. So adult corals that have a strong population of zooxanthellae get a lot of their nutrition from the byproducts produced by the algae, but the babies don't have that. So they re it's really important for them to have a heterotrophic food source or something that is actually fed to them regularly. Uh, but of course that, that causes struggles because those things can cause a lot of nutrient spikes. Um, so we do check our water regularly, especially for phosphate spikes. The little babies tend to be really sensitive to higher phosphate levels. Really anything over 0 0.03, 0 0.04, and you'll start to see some, some changes in the babies. So we be, we're very careful with that. We have a lot of feeding, but we also make sure that we keep our bacteria population in the tank really strong so that it can absorb any extra phosphate in the water very quickly and we use a lot of filter socks to pull out all that excess food right after we feed the babies um, and then after the babies establish a good relationship with the zooxanthellae and they get a nice dark color that can take about a month and really about two months till it's a very strong relationship then you can start increasing the light And really what, what we're trying to do here is figure out how to maximize their growth rate in these early stages. Um, we want to be able to produce thousands of sexually produced coral recruits. Um, and that way you have thousands of new individuals, you have new genetic diversity in that population. So the mission here is not to just create asexual fragments. If you have um, only 50 corals and you cut them up all and make 50,000 corals, you still have a very limited genetic diversity. So if some of those corals are not tolerant to disease, you're going to wipe out a much larger portion of your population with that disease. However, if all 50,000 of those corals are a different genetic individual, you potentially have more resilience in that population to things like disease or warmer temperatures. So by hopefully by really focusing on this sexual reproduction of corals, we can build a stronger, more resilient population of corals in Florida. My name is Carrie O'Neill. I'm the Coral Nursery Manager at the Florida Aquarium Center for Conservation. Thank you for watching today and come back and check in with us soon. Can you cue me with certain like questions or something or you just want me to keep talking?